Well hello, I'm Wendy Burton, the GP from Brisbane, and I'm here with my colleague, Dr Kelly Tatham, who's an obstetrician gynaecologist. And we're going to talk today about perineal injuries. So Kelly, for an old girl like me, would yeah. you please walk me through the definitions of first degree, second degree, third degree, fourth degree tears, and what that means with the new nomenclature, which yeah. is the OAC injury. Yeah. Okay, so in childbirth, um, a lot of first uh, first time mothers will have some degree of tear. Um, we talk about first degree tears involving just the vaginal mucosa. Uh, the secondary degree tears involve the vaginal muscles and the mucosa. And then we talk about major perineal injury or OAC, which is obstetric anal sphincter injury, uh, where you can have either a third degree tear involving the external anal sphincter um, in a 3A tear this would involve less than 50% of the sphincter. 3B tear is more than 50% of that sphincter. And a 3C tear involves also um, the internal anal sphincter. And then we get to fourth degree tear, which means the rectal mucosa is also involved. 70% mm -hmm. um, of women having their first baby will in fact sustain a, at least a second degree tear, but only about three to 4% of women uh, having their first time baby will um, sustain a third or fourth degree tear. So Kelly, would you please explain what are the risk factors for women in having a tear? Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, there are modifiable but plenty of non-modifiable risk factors. Um, the women who uh, have shorter perineums tend to be uh, Southeast Asian women, uh, Indonesian, Indian women, um, and we don't know if it's just that they have a shorter perineal body or if they have a different collagen, but we do know that they're at higher risk um, of sustaining larger tears. Um, also, women who have a BMI of less than 18 uh, also for a similar reason. Then we look at uh, babies who themselves are large, so a large head circumference mm -hmm. um, above the 90th centile, so a head above 35, 36 centimetres. Uh, and babies that are large for gestational age, and in particular those that are above four kilograms. Um, also, when you look at the type of birth, how, how babies are birthed uh, matters. So those that have either a very precipitous second stage with uh, little perineal support, mm -hmm. unfortunately uh, have a higher rate. Those that uh, have an instrumental delivery, uh, especially those having forceps without an episiotomy, uh, have a higher rate and those that have malpresentation so the baby that is born uh, with a hand up uh, or in the OP position which uh, means that the, there is a greater diameter um, presenting first through the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. So Kelly you mentioned that there's modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors so what could a woman or should a woman be doing if she's wanting to reduce her chance of having her 70% chance for the first vaginal delivery of having a perineal tear. Yeah. Um, so I think it all starts early in the pregnancy. Um, I speak to women about gestational weight gain in particular. So we know that women who have an increased gestational weight gain above current guidelines are more likely to have a large gestational age infant. Mm -hmm. um, antenatally also, if you were to diagnose someone as having a large baby, you may be able to offer them induction at 38 weeks gestation, or if they're at particularly high risk, you could offer them a cesarean section. Uh, but for most women, that, that isn't completely necessary, although it may be a qu quite a reasonable maternal choice as well. Um, antenatally, I think it's important to, to talk about the role of perineal massage. Um, in the third trimester, yes, there are some hormonal changes that soften all of the tissues, um, and do increase um, the dimensions um, down below. However, antenatal perineal massage has been shown to help reduce in tears as well. The role for EpiNo, uh, which is a product that can be bought by women uh, on the internet and some pharmacies, um, hasn't been shown in the latest trial to reduce the risk of tears. Anecdotally, I think it helps some women, but we don't know who those women really are. I don't think we've defined that population clearly as yet. The things that we can do uh, intrapartum to help avoid tears uh, is to perform perineal massage, especially in the second stage of labour, to really importantly protect the perineum. So uh, hand, one hand on the fetal head, uh, maintaining fetal head flexion uh, and also protecting the perineum with some perineal support. 
and the use of warm compresses in the second stage of labour has also been shown to help stretch and reduce tears uh, during there. If a woman needs to have an instrumental delivery, uh, it would be preferable for women to have a vacuum over a forceps for prevention of perineal injury. However, that's obviously not possible in all women and forceps for some women is the most, are the most appropriate choice. If a woman is having an instrumental delivery, it's important to discuss with her the use of episiotomy being beneficial and can reduce the risk of actually having oasis. So without episiotomy, we know that women having vacuum or forceps mm -hmm. without an episiotomy will have a one in four chance of oasis. So really important to be doing that um, for those women. So Kelly, what's the impact, what, what consequences flow for a woman if she's had a perineal injury? So for a woman who's had a first or even a small second degree injury, they don't actually all need to be sutured unless they're bleeding. And some of them sit together very well um, and, and don't need anything done. It is important to examine every woman thoroughly, however, and um, it has been recognised now that any woman that has a tear really should have a per rectal examination by a qualified uh, practitioner to exclude um, the unfortunate incident of having a higher up tear and a, a, a buttonhole tear through to the bottom. So everyone needs a very good thorough examination, but if they have that small second degree tear or first degree tear, it doesn't actually need to be sutured. Um, in those having a, a second degree tear, there is some evidence to say that that doesn't need to be sutured even if it is a good sign. However, I think that for comfort, um, most women do prefer that and I, I think it tends to heal a little bit quicker. For those having a third or fourth degree tear, um, you need someone who's skilled at performing the procedure, um, or at least someone being supervised doing the procedure, good lighting, good pain relief, and that usually requires a spinal anaesthetic, mm -hmm. uh, in theatre usually, um, and repair in layers. Um, as well, we cover with some antibiotics and then give them a periods for at least two weeks, right. so that they're not straining mm -hmm. and getting constipated and pushing against all, that, all, all the sutures. They really, really, really need some good debriefing on their delivery. So one of the consequences that I see commonly is psychological trauma. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that they've sustained a third degree tear, um, but that they've had they've been separated from their baby during the mm -hmm. repair. That there's they've been concerned that they've heard the words incontinence and they're scared that they're going to be incontinent mm -hmm. and never sexually active ever again. And that they've you know had a forceps or a vacuum and baby might have you know needed some resuscitation so first and foremost i think um, when we're seeing them um, straight after that day one postpartum is debriefing the woman about the events of the delivery and what in fact it means and i do try and give some early reassurance that 60 to 80 percent of women will actually recover completely from um, their third or fourth degree tear mm -hmm. so kelly for some women that obviously have more significant injuries and are more significantly impacted. So at what point would you think it important that women are referred? Uh, to who should we be referring? And what's the process? Or are there dedicated clinics? Or, or how does this work? So most uh, Queensland hospitals will have uh, their own form of follow-up for women who have sustained a third or fourth degree tear. Um, in smaller hospitals, it might be that they're followed up in a gynaecology clinic and referred to the appropriate um, multidisciplinary team as they see fit. Uh, for the larger hospitals in Queensland, um, we have dedicated OASIS clinics which uh, usually involve pelvic floor physiotherapists, uh, continence nurses and gynaecologists and or urogynaecologists and colorectal surgeons. So usually the hospitals will arrange uh, for follow-up to be done and the first follow-up is usually at the six to eight weeks postpartum to see uh, first of all uh, what symptomatology they're having, and on examination to pick up any early um, early problems. So the most common things I see would be suture migration. So the sutures that we put in the anal sphincters are PDS, which is like really strong, tough fishing line. And if they tend to migrate near the skin, women often feel a bit of a pinching sensation, mm -hmm. which is unpleasant. Um, and so often we can fix that um, for them at the six week mark. Um, and reassure them that that will actually get better over time. Uh, the other thing we see is a little bit of granulation tissue, which mm -hmm. if it's not treated, sometimes it bleeds when they've been having to course and causes worry. So we can treat that also on examination. If they have really um, overt um, symptomatic faecal incontinence or any sign that there might be a uh, fistula, 
um, then we would refer them early uh, to our colorectal colleagues for consideration of secondary repair. However, thankfully, that's actually quite rare. Um, some women, what most women will complain of uh, in the first few weeks is that they've had some fleeting uh, fatal incontinence mm -hmm. and or uh, some stool incontinence and usually then they will see the physiotherapist and, and work really hard on restoring their function, which most women do retain uh, over the first six months. So those women that are no longer symptomatic at the six week mark usually are reassured and they don't have any further follow up um, at that point. The women who are symptomatic at six to eight weeks, however, not frankly symptomatic, so they might have had some minor fleeting um, incontinence, um, have dedicated follow-up in the in the physiotherapy department. They work really hard for the for, for that six months, and if they are still symptomatic at six months, it is really important to have referral then to colorectal um, surgery, where they generally will do an endoanal ultrasound to assess the integrity of the muscles and also endoanal manometry, which assesses the muscle function and the nerve function as well, um, to decide whether further treatment is beneficial. So Kelly, for those women who have sustained an OAC, so that um, obstetric anal sphincter injury, what are their options or what would be the recommendation for them the next time if they're going to have an, another baby? So next time around, Caesar, vaginal delivery, what are the recommendations? Yeah. So in terms of mode of delivery, uh, the women that have sustained major perineal injury have a choice. Um, those that have been completely asymptomatic and healed well and psychologically are prepared for another vaginal birth um, would be supported in that. The data we have show that the uh, rate of repeat major perineal injury is between five to seven percent. The concern is that the women who have a repeat vaginal birth that don't tear they may have an increase in their symptoms. So those women that are already symptomatic, mm -hmm. we suggest that they consider having a, a caesarean section for that reason. So because they may have worsening of any symptoms that are there. There have been some studies done looking at asymptomatic women and doing endoanal ultrasound and manometry on all women. And even in those women that are asymptomatic, if they have only a tiny bit of muscle holding on, or a tiny bit of muscle function holding on, mm. then they are um, advised to have a cesarean. And it would be nice to think that we could offer that kind of assessment to all women, but at this point in time, it's not practical in Queensland and it's not available. Mm. So as it stands, most women who are asymptomatic, if they wish, we would support that and have an experienced uh, person at delivery doing perineal massage support and only episiotomy if it's indicated. So routine episiotomy has not been shown with a normal birth um, to reduce the risk of recurrent tear. Mm -hmm. And if a woman doesn't feel confident about a vaginal yep. birth, what are her options? Well, her options are really to be offered a caesarean section. So as long as she's been thoroughly counseled, um, most uh, obstetricians would be more than happy to offer a woman a caesarean section. All right, Kelly, thank you very much.